namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suchedo ye olahudi samyao san putoshi. Wushang shen shen wei miao fa bai qian wan jie nan zao yu. 我今见闻得受持, Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, good evening to you, good afternoon to you. My name is Hung Shur, and today is October 31st. It is Halloween uh, here in, it's October 31st here in Australia. It's uh, October 30th back in California. We're coming to you from the uh, southeast corner of Queensland here, and I uh, want you to appreciate my desktop uh, and make sure that you all identify Guanyin Bodhisattva here in the upper left hand corner as she is blessing a golden swamp wallaby, which is a rare edition of wallabies that we happen to proudly be home to here in uh, the rainforest of southeastern Queensland. So we're going to be looking into the Flower Garland Sutra, the Abhatamsaka Sutra, and uh, we're going to look at the 10 stages of the Bodhisattva's training. Uh, we're on, we finished the chapter, we're back to stage one, the stage of happiness, and we're looking at it through a slightly different lens. We have a new take on the 10 stages chapter, which is we're listening to the text in English flow. We're just running through it, uh, less analysis, more listening to the language, listening to sutras as literature, trying to piece together the principles uh, in bigger chunks than ordinarily. So that's what we're all about. Um, do you all have the, there we go. There we go. This is a new, I put the uh, Dharma request on a slide. And let's see here. Yeah, so it's not an entirely successful because when I make it full screen, we lose that first row of Chinese. Let's see if I can shift it all down. Ready? One, two. Did that work? Let's try that. Yeah, a little better. Okay. So, um, we're going to chant. We're going to invoke spiritual presence, ask the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to come and draw near. Please join me if you care to. Wow. 
last time. this were a Methodist church, we would have a choir master at the organ playing that melody. So here we got a monk with the banjo. How does that work? Okay, here we go. Okay, here's our text. Uh, let's do a check-in here. We have a very windy day here in the end of October, uh, which is as people in the northern hemisphere know we're reversed so we're in spring summer uh, California's autumn winter and one of the, the markers of our summer here is the emergence of the first lotus flowers we have real Australian lotuses which are brilliant just spectacular and they're each one is different and every phase of it we're remarking with Ben today that the leaves first emerge, and they're just these, everybody's fantasy of remarkable toad, toad set setting leaves. And then comes the blossom, and the blossom is this perfect spherical, can't describe it, you have to see it, it's visual. And then when it opens, the lotus is just this brilliant, brilliant thing. And then this long stem with thorns on it, interestingly. Lotuses have prickly thorns. Didn't know. You don't slide your hand down on the lotus stem. Um, not like rose thorns, but they're still distinct. Uh, I don't know what's the, the engineering function of a lotus stem thorn, maybe to keep something off it. I don't know, bugs. Or but then the roots are down in the muck, and that's the idea. The, the water sits there. It's usually stagnant water. But no matter how turbid and yucky the water is, the, the blossom of the lotus is this pristine, perfect, beautiful uh, flower. And then, gone. And out comes, from the lotus comes the, uh, the actual seed pod. And the seed pod is this very bizarre alien looking thing that uh, uh, provides food. Every, every bit of the lotus is edible, they say. <laughs> so, not that I recommend it, but there are lotus root powder, uh, famous drink in Hangzhou, Lianofen. Uh, Hangzhou in, in Jiangsu province uh, has a traditional beverage made from lotus root powder. It's, it's kind of like a jelly. It's really quite spectacular, wonderful. So anyway, lotus, lotuses around here, I'm looking at one first lotus of the year is now directly across from me outside the Buddha Hall. So. Very wonderful experience. Um, what you're seeing in Guanyin's pond, if you look if people with sharp eyes, those are lilies. That's a different kind of aquatic flower. There used to be lotuses in the pond there, but I think they kind of lived their life cycle. So, Okay, now, uh, here we go. Here's our text. And we have come to the last of the vows, last of ten vows. We're going to read this one here. We'll isolate it, make it bigger here so folks can actually see it. That's the one. Yep, there we go. One more time, please. A little bigger. Oh, we want it bigger still. Uh, that's too big. A little less. There, perfect. Okay. Now let me check in. Is that readable, Sam? Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, as we've been doing the uh, the vows, these are so. This is the real heartbeat of the entire Bodhisattva path. All of the ten stages depend on the first stage. It's the foundation. So the Bodhisattva builds that strong foundation here in the first stage. And the, the strength of that foundation depends on vows that he makes, V-O-W, like a vow, like a promise, like a pledge, uh, an oath, 
a lot of words that we have to talk about the same thing. And what the deal with the vows is, it's the compass heading. It's how he knows where he's going, how she knows where she's going. And if you want to get to Brisbane, you better point your car north. You better get on the M1 going north. Uh, you could also go south. Road runs both ways. But if you want to go to Brisbane, you got to figure out which is north, right? If you're in San Francisco and you want to get to Santa Rosa, you've got to get on 101 going north. If you get on 101 going south, you go to San Jose instead. So um, the compass heading of the first stage is where the Bodhisattva knows where he or she is going, and that's the first stage. That's what we're doing. And so we've had these incredible, incredible vows which point the Bodhisattva towards what he or she wants. And we also learned uh, from our Tang Dynasty guide, Master Changguan, Master Qingliang, clear and cool, uh, that uh, he, he said vow is uh, xi chou, uh, is chiu, uh, was it uh, xi chou, was, there were two words that he, let's see here, hold on, I've got it here. His, um, let's see here, he said, vows are, getting there, um, he said, what is a vow? It is, uh, xi chou, right, shi, xi chou. These, uh, he said, this is a, this, you're looking at a Tang Dynasty, that's a 1300 year old commentary. So, again, let's talk about the word vow, this, this one right here. He says, in general, let's discuss vow, that thing. So what is a vow? It is the meaning, xi chou, hoping to seek, wanting to get. And that never occurred to me before that a vow is not the thing. It's before the thing. It's what you say in your heart you want. Sui xin chou, you follow the, you follow your heart. What does your heart want? So, sounds a little desirous, doesn't it? Bodhisattvas are supposed to have no desire. It's a selfless desire. Uh, you sui xin chou, follow heart's seeking, meaning is. So you, this, what a vow is, is what your heart wants, and you really want it. But the secret is, the difference is, it's not based on self. It's not what I want. It's a bigger, it's the real, the true I. And you could say all roads lead home. So all the compass bearings ultimately come back to the Buddha nature, if that's the home. And the, the seeking, that is the vow, is based on wanting that same thing for everyone else. So wanting to bring everybody back home, however you can do it. And of course, what's the text, the subtext of that is, lots of us feel lost, feel like we don't know the way back home. And there's, in the quiet times in the morning, in the late times at night, uh, times of disease and times of fear and times of climate disruption, you say, how did we go so far wrong? How do we get back? And that's where the Bodhisattva's vow says, I'll show you. Follow me. Let's go this way. I know the way back. Let's go this way. So that's the vow. That's the seeking. Xi chou, as it says. Seeking and wishing. So here in the first stage, it's the Bodhisattva's like getting packing his backpack. He's preparing his hiking boots. Her compass is in her hand, and she's going, let's see now, I better get this compass correct. Uh, there, that's the way to go. Because there's a lot of road ahead. There's nine stages to go before Buddhahood, uh, and this is the very first step on the trailhead. Okay, mixing my metaphors left and right, but I think you all get the idea. Here we go, ready? Let's see if we can make it work. Yo fa da yen. Yen yu yi che shi jie. Cheng anodolo samyao samputi. Bu li yi mao duan chu. Yu yi mao duan chu. Jie shi shi xian. Chu sheng. Chu jia. 
，易道成，成正觉，转法轮，入涅槃，得佛警戒。大智慧力与年年中，随一切众生心实现成佛，令得其灭，一一三菩提，至一切法界，即涅盘相，一一因说法，令一切众生心得欢喜，是入大涅盘，而不断菩萨行。Boy, that the the breadth of that. Even as I read it, it is breathtaking. Okay, ready? We ready to? And then when we get to the end, for the last time, we're going to do our refrain. We're going to do our vow chant. So let me get ready for that. Let me get there. Here we go. Ready? Let's go. They further make great vows, vowing within every world to realize Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. They vow that. Without leaving a hair's tip, and on the tip of every hair, to show, being born, leaving home, going to the way place, accomplishing proper awakening, turning the Dharma wheel, and entering Nirvana, they vow to show how to obtain the Buddha's states and the power of great wisdom. They vow that in thought after thought, in accord with the minds of living beings, they will show how to accomplish Buddhahood and realize Nirvana. With right awakening, they vow to know how all dharma realms are characterized by nirvana. They vow that they will speak dharma with only one sound, and yet make every living being happy at heart. They vow they will enter great nirvana, yet never abandon the bodhisattva's behavior. Okay, it's like, whoa! All right, let's. You can't just. Not unpack it. There's too much there. So let me unpack it a bit. This is this is huge, right? This is what's a vow? Vows. People make vows. They, I vow I'm gonna quit smoking, <laughs> right? So、mm, good, hard.、Uh, multiple times in my life as a monk, I've given up sugar. You know, I vow to not use any sugar. And then three years later,、oh, I better do that again because I slipped and I'm putting sugar in my coffee. You know. Or at one point, I gave, I vowed to give up dairy. I became a vegan, and that was years and years ago. And that was hard, because that means yogurt, ice cream. <sighs> give up ice cream. Give up cheese. Oh man, I know people who. I mean, cheese is especially vegetarians. Right? Cheese is important. If you come from Wisconsin. You're German, Wisconsin, Wisconsin. You can't give up cheese, and you do if you're a vegan, because as especially I'll say no again, mind you,、uh, entire economies are based on cheese. Entire cuisines are based on cheese: ice cream, yogurt, dairy, milk,、mm, cream, all that, all that stuff. Not knocking it for people who for whom. Uh, well, ghee, right? G H E E, ghee. That's hard to say. Ghee, clarified butter, is considered the king of flavors in India.、Uh, so, big thing, to give that up. My experience. I won't judge it. I won't value it. I'll just tell you my experience.、Um, as a monk,、uh, one of the things that that you Deal with is desire, and desire. What is desire? Wealth, desire for money, wealth, desire for sex, relationship between genders or among genders, food, that sense of being full and not wanting to be empty, wealth, sex, fame.、Uh, let's say, fame is number three. Food is number four. Fame is popularity. It's that sense of not wanting to be anonymous. Wanting to be recognized and related,、uh, when it's a desire,、mm. sleep is number five. Wealth, sex, fame, food, sleep. Primal, raw, crude desire coming from the nature.、Uh, there's also subtle desires, 
they say. And this is the Buddha's list, right? He says what? Sights, sounds, smells, tastes, sensations of touch, dharmas. They're invisible but real, subtle desires. So, wealth, sex, fame, food, and sleep. Sights, sounds, smells, tastes, desires. What are they? Not judging, not saying bad or wrong. Saying what? Saying once you decide that you've found the direction back to your nature, that any wisdom, any transcendence you're going to have in your life is going to come from within, once you make that decision to deal with the inner landscape and all the thoughts and feelings and emotions inside, the, fa the false thoughts and attachments that the Buddha said are what kill us, once you make that decision, desire works against you. What is desire? Desire says, what I'm looking for is out there. I'm, once I get that beautiful sight, once I get that perfect sound that I'm looking for, I'll be happy and satisfied and it's good forever. And wisdom says, mistake. Tell me the last time you got an object of desire that satisfied you. That was good, that was the last one you needed. Problem, desire is like a fire, it consumes and consumes and consumes and consumes and you burn up. So once you experience that yourself, you go, I need to make some decisions, otherwise any promises I make to myself about cultivation are just noise in the wind, blows away. So, problem with my experience back to Derry was as a monk who, as a you know, monastic cultivator or a lay cultivator, the more dairy I put into my body, the more desire I had at the end of my senses. My eyes were sticky. My thoughts were sticky. Who would believe it? It's true. If you're a cultivator, not that you shut your eyes and don't look at the world, you do, but you don't look twice. You see it, respond, you know it, you recognize it, you can see through it but you don't look back seeking pretty forms, attractive structures, attractive shapes. You let them go as they go, right? When I was a cheese-eating, milk-drinking, ice-cream-guzzling, uh, yogurt-growing, yogurt-making uh, person, I found that it was harder to let go of sounds and sights that pleased me. Strange, but true. They were stickier. I stopped drinking milk. I made a vow. I said, I'm going to try it. Try to go without dairy. Let go of the cheese and the yogurt. And within two weeks, my eyes and my thoughts and my ears were less sticky. Hard to describe. How do you experience that? I didn't have that layer inside my skin, inside my cells of dairy fat. And doctors will tell you, you also don't have casein. Interesting. Dr. Colin Campbell, T. Colin Campbell, who was an American hero, the man who wrote the, co-authored the book called The China Study, the largest public health survey in history, human history, he and his son, had published revisions to the to new new editions. Anyway, Dr. Campbell is a uh, a cancer researcher at Cornell, or yeah, I think it was Cornell or Dartmouth. Dr. Campbell turned on cancer in laboratory animals, and then turned it off, and then turned it back on. He was researching uh, with white rats, which you know, is a problem from a compassion point of view. But these are the animals that he could measure. And he would add one ingredient to the diet of the laboratory rats. And they would, their cancer cells, tumors would grow in the rat. And they would measure them. He removed that 
ingredient from their diet and the tumors went away. And what was the ingredient? C-A-S-E-I-N, casein, milk protein. Exclusively that. He would add whole milk to the rat's diet. Tumors would grow. He would remove the whole milk and their tumors would shrink and go away. He turned on and turned off cancer in laboratory rats using milk protein. So, in a world that has breast cancer, you think, I wonder whether cow's milk is necessary or goat's milk, right? Whether we need, you know, baby cows stop drinking their mother's milk at a thousand pounds, then they don't drink it again. You don't see baby cows continue to nurse at mother cow. Why do humans need three glasses a day the rest of their lives? Hmm, I know, I know. All the, <laughs> the moms who are listening are going, ah, ah, you know. Stay out of my kitchen, monk. What are you doing? My experience was that when I made a vow to end milk and to get rid of dairy in my diet to see if I could do without it. I was raised a milk drinker, cheese eater, ice cream maker, yogurt maker. Totally in that realm, my, my father came from, who was a gourmet chef, came from Quebec where there's lots of dairy. You need it in the cold winter. I let it go and I found that I could control my six senses easier, less desire. Funny, kind of organic, that dairy made me sticky, made my thoughts stickier. Funny, huh? True, true story. Okay, bodhisattvas make vast vows, not worried about dairy products. They're worried about how that without leaving a tip of a hair, they are going to, in that tiniest of spaces, here's, let's see, tip of a hair, it's just that big. In that tiny space, they are going to reveal, to show, under their control, all the things that Buddhists do. Being born, leaving home, becoming a Buddha, subduing the demons, turning the Dharma wheel, subduing the demons, becoming a Buddha. Those things happen one and then the other. Then entering nirvana, distributing sharira. Those, all those things are going to show in the tiniest of places. And then in every hair tip throughout the universe, they're going to show those ba xiang cheng dao, the eight signs, the eight hallmarks of Buddhahood. Isn't that esoteric? Isn't that weird? There's a list. That is definitely a list. Our beloved Dr. Konza said that all of Buddhism is lists of practices because here were these wise cultivators out in the jungle, in the bush, passing their time with practices. So you get the eight hallmarks of becoming a Buddha but different lists of those eight, by the way. So yeah, interesting, that's Dr. Kohn's theory that all of Buddhism is just lists of practice. Four noble truths, eightfold path, 12 links, 100 dharmas of the Sarvastivadins, right? So, okay, uh, they vow to show how to obtain the Buddhist states and the power of great wisdom. Why? So that we can see that and go, yeah, me too. I wanna do that. Show me how I want to do that. I want to attain the Buddha's states in great wisdom. They vow that in thought after thought, in accord with the minds of beings, they're going to show you how to become a Buddha and realize nirvana. There will be an audience if they can do that. Right? Oh, what do we get? We get demonstrated how to use cryptocurrencies. <laughs> that's, that's what we want to learn. Yeah. Money, 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 money. They vow they will speak Dharma with a single sound and make every being happy at heart. Oh, man. Now, there's a great vow. Om. Are you all happy at heart? Om. If I had the bodhisattva's vows, that would, that's all it would take. 
Om. To make you happy. <sighs> they vow they will integrate nirvana and yet never abandon bodhisattva's behavior. Okay, there's a big vow. Figure that one out. What does that mean? It means they're done and yet they didn't quit. Contradiction much? There you go. Why stick with dualities? Why think that's the only way? There's both. Bodhisattvas are going to do both. They're going to enter Maha Nirvana. Ta Nyapan. What is Maha Nirvana? The end of the path. They're done. They're, they've won. They won. I won't say the squid games. They won. They're the one winner. But... They never abandon bodhisattva's behavior. They still stick around, saying it over and over again. Look within. Ask yourself. Look for yourself. See if you can find anything inside you that corresponds to me or mine. Hear that crow laughing? Indeed, he's saying, living beings, we are so silly. So I was walking down to lunch the other day, and there was this big crow. Oh my goodness, just a, I think it might have been a raven. I took pictures that had the raven, ro, ravens and crows are different physiognomy. And he was poking and poking and poking at something. And I thought, uh-oh, hope that's not a baby bird because I know the parents that are raising their, I'm feeding, I'm helping them feed their children here in, the, in the, the, the season of chicks that we are in right now here in Queensland. So I walked over to see what it was. Sure enough, cane toad. And he had flipped it over and, he was, and I was gonna say, be careful, don't eat that part. That's the poison part. And the crow was like, get out of my life, you, don't, you human, I know what I'm doing. You know, so there it was. And the poor cane toad, like, ah, you know, being pecked apart by a crow. So um, to be able to uh, stick around and say, yep, don't do anything evil, but instead be good. That's the teaching. Shi Zhu Fo Jiao. Right? This is what all Buddhists teach. And the Bodhisattva never gets tired of saying it. Doesn't get tired of saying it. Says it again. Says it again. Never abandons the Bodhisattva's behavior, even though he's in Maha Nirvana. I mean that's that's deep. How do you how do you manage that contradiction? Become a Buddha. Come back and tell me. Right? You tell me. Okay. Incredible, incredible vows. Truly wonderful. Finish off this one. There's more to go. You ready? One more time. Here we go. My camera is in the way. There's our refrain. They will show how to enter the stage of great wisdom and establish all dharmas. They will show how, with the power of dharma wisdom, the power of spiritual attainments, the power of illusions and transformations, how to completely fill the dharma realm. And I'll read it and then we'll sing it. Vast and great as the Dharma realm, ultimate as empty space, to the ends of future time, throughout all numbers of eons, without cease. And that's our cue to celebrate. Sing it where we can, because that's, it helps us carry it away. <laughs>
vast and great as the Dharma realm, ultimate as empty space, to the ends of future time. Without seas, never stops. Without seas, without seas. Should we do it again? Keep it rolling. Vast and great as the Dharma realm, ultimate as empty space. Have to breathe here to the ends of future time. Another breath. Without seas, without seas, without seas. So that's the last time we'll be doing the, that refrain. I kind of like that. Uh, like it, it, um, it's like an earworm. It goes in there and it lodges itself. And you find yourself, you know, at the red light uh, at the intersection, waiting for the light to change while everybody's doing their left turns. And some, just out of the blue, you hear in your ear, vast and great is the Dharma realm, ultimate as empty space, to the ends of future time, throughout all numbers of eons without seas. And the light turns green and you go through and your, your mind comes back to the state of the Avatamsaka Sutra and the Bodhisattva path. And that's, that's the idea. These are, uh, as, as the Lotus Sutra says, Nian, be Guan Yin Li, be mindful of the strength of Guan Yin Bodhisattva. And here we're mindful of the, the Avatamsaka Bodhisattvas. And you go, oh, those vows. Yeah, yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> who could do, who could do things like that? show how to enter the stage of great wisdom and establish all dharmas. What does it mean to establish all dharmas? Good grief. It means that from the bodhisattva's mind in this state of great wisdom, you know what is right and what is wrong. You know what is right and what is wrong. Um, currently, currently, there's a great controversy that's a significant, this is a significant moment in America, certainly. I don't know, I don't think this is happening in Australia, but in America right now, um, the, pol the politicization, the politics of society is nearly complete, nearly total. So everything requires people to take sides and it shows up in the great state of Texas, where uh, parents are wanting to pass laws to make it illegal to teach their children certain truths that have been established, set up long time, accepted truth, and the parents want to review it so that their children won't be taught things like the Holocaust happened. <laughs> there, uh, the ideas that, and the, the point I'm bringing this in is not to introduce politics in our Dharma lecture, but just to say that when facts are up for grabs, when accepted truths, scientific research, when peer-reviewed studies about what really happened is now under review, um, it's a challenge to, to, to say what is true, what is false. So as you establish all dharmas. Now, uh, this, that sword can cut, that knife can cut the hand that holds it because what if what was taught was whitewashed of facts to begin with? That's another story. Or partial truths. So ultimately, um, to my mind, uh, as a student of my teacher, and that is to say an educator, someone who loves education. Let's just give it to Confucius, as a, uh, one who admires Confucius. This is what we should be talking about, what to teach 
our young people, what to, what to discuss. I think the, this is more important than making money, to my mind. That if I have 24 hours in a day, I would like to devote as many hours as possible to discussing with the members of my community from the immediate, immediate friends sitting in the room to the neighbors who live in your street to this, the community in the city to this, the state to the nation to the world. This is what we should be talking about. What is truth? What really happened? Who gets to say what is truth? And how to expand the measure of our minds to accept different points of view. That's important. That's really important. Otherwise, what gets established as truth is our only the power holding few and too often history shows us that who gets to say what is true too often is the hands that hold the guns policy is determined by the power holders who too often are men with guns and what wisdom tells us is that often the truth is held by the, the power, the voiceless. By giving voice to the voiceless, what we discover is truth is bigger than we thought. From a cultivator's point of view, from the Buddhist point of view, is truth that lasts arises from principle. And where is principle? It's inside that we all hold those principles. And if we start listening to the inner principles, what we discover is this two words, three words. It's, or let's say five words. It's the same for everybody. That truth is the same for everybody, regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of social status, regardless of bank account. That the fundamental things have not changed. And as soon as we leave those fundamental things to say, oh, I don't think you should vote. I think the only people whose votes count are people who look like me. We've left principle behind. And the, what happens? It won't sustain. It will, it will fall. So those principles are fundamental. They're in the nature. And once we, if we can accept that, what we discover is, my goodness, those principles are true not only for humans, they're true for all parents who love their children and who don't want their children taken away from them to be somebody else's dinner, for example. Right? So uh, I think you all get the point. But here is, that's, what am I discussing? I'm discussing what does it mean to establish all dharmas? It means that once the Bodhisattva attains this wisdom, and this is the vow that he's making, our Bodhisattva vows to, to realize the Buddha's wisdom. That's his goal, that's her goal. And yet that's not the end, that's not the end of the road. The reason for doing that is so that you can establish all dharmas. That's the phrase. What is it in Chinese? It is an li yi qie fa, right? peacefully set up all, you could say, establish the, the, the standards of reality. That's another way to translate that. What is the standards of reality? It's based on na the nature that is so evident through precepts, samadhi, and wisdom, through looking within, meditating, and having it show, clearing away all the things between your, your awareness and the nature, the Buddha nature you discover, gee, these principles are everywhere around us. There's nowhere they're not. These, these principles are just the way things are. This is the Tao, this is the Dharma, right? So then the society you make based on that wisdom lasts. And it's words like fair, words like just, it's fair, it's gong ping, it's just, it's yo zheng yi, 
right? It's right for everyone. And ah, that's the society that is it allowed to sustain. The society that's based on, I want more and more and more, and it's all, it's as much as I can grab is mine, and if you want it, get out of my way, and I got guns, and I'll, you know, that society will fail. So we are currently failing. The breakdown of nature shows that, that the way we've set it up based on selfish greed and desire and anger and strength of arms, that will fail. So anyway, the Bodhisattva shows with the power of wisdom, the power of spiritual attainments. Ooh power of illusions. That phrase, I didn't, I don't think we talked about that the last time around. What is the power of illusion? Did you all catch that going through? What was it? It was uh, Huan Tong, Huan Tong. This is the Bodhisattva's ability to put on a show. They can put on a show. They can show you something that, is, that gives you a reason to change your behavior. Scare you into it with a stick. Entice you into changing with a carrot, both carrot and stick. If you're angry and mean and nasty and tough, they show themselves to be meaner and nastier and tougher than you are. Right? Zhu <coughs> Fu Fa. They use, they, they s subdue you. If you're timid, shy and anxious and softer, gentle and kind, they lead you forward. The she shou fa, they gather you in through enticements. That's the carrot. So whatever it takes, bodhisattvas will do it. And the goal is to end your suffering. Um, doctors that uh, have the pediatricians, children, child doctors, uh, right? They know how to give a jab of vaccine without frightening the child too much. Which kid likes needles? Kids don't like needles. We don't want needles. But if, you know, if you know that getting the vaccine is going to save your child's life. Uh, now, this week, uh, up five, age five and above, are, there's now a vaccine, a reduced dose, uh, coronavirus vaccine for children. And the doctors, the nurses, are going to have to, you know, show the puppet. Like, you just hear the puppet, oh, look at the cute puppy, and zinc. Ah, oh, all done. Huh? Oh, that wasn't so bad. Yeah, you know. Or candy. Candy is, you see doctors who are skillful at giving candy. The power of illusion. You catch the child's attention and make them laugh or giggle so that the needle isn't so scary. And then, if you use, you know, I, <laughs> I was talking to somebody the other day, very intelligent, very accomplished, wise, good grandfather in his uh, 70s who said, I don't trust science. I don't really like science. I, don't, I think science, mm, you're, they're, they're always trying to do stuff to you, you know. And from being this accomplished, wise, reliable, steady, good-hearted adult human, they became a child when it came to science, right? Well, science has discovered a pill now. An American drug company called Merck has got a pill that should be able, they're still testing it now, but there's good news is this last week, is that there's a pill coming, doesn't require refrigeration, doesn't require the needle, get rid of the needle. And it will, when you swallow the pill with some water, it will prevent you from the worst of COVID. Whether or not it's a complete vaccine pill, don't know yet, but it's a preventative. 
and it will boost your chances of getting through the pandemic. Because uh, in a conversation last week with uh, a researcher who has, who's a, a community organizer, a COVID, leading the anti-COVID uh, task force for a community, he uh, reported to our board of directors that um, what the experts are saying now is you will either get vaccinated or you will get sick. You'll get infected or you'll get injected. Because why? They say it looks like everybody is going to be exposed to COVID at some point. That uh, here in Australia, as of tomorrow, the regulations are going away. And uh, Queensland, where we are now, has had zero cases for several days, zero cases. By comparison, the United States had 1,300 deaths yesterday. 1,300 people died in America. Here in Queensland, zero. Taiwan, zero. Um, Singapore had 5,000 infections yesterday. 5,000 people in Singapore caught COVID yesterday. Uh, you know, so uh, what they're saying is that if you don't get the vaccine, there's a very good chance that your lungs will pick up that deadly virus. Not a question of if, it's just when. So good idea to get vaccinated. And Merck, this drug manufacturer, big pharma in US, the scientists have done something remarkable, which is they found a way to put in pill form this preventative measure. So it's possible that, uh, and furthermore, haha, even better, Merck said anybody, any country who wants the formula to make it yourselves, we're going to give it to you free. Give it to you for free. Even better. That is the spirit of compassion, indeed. So, uh, whatever power of illusions the bodhisattvas can use to get us through the crisis and also their transformations, they can make things change, they can control reality in remarkable ways. They will do this to fill the Dharma realm and they'll do it vast and great as the Dharma realm. Okay, that is that, that last bit there is the proposition of infinity. Meaning, a vow can be one thought, and it can be come and go, over. That thought, gone. That was a great thought, it's gone. The Bodhisattva says, I'm going to have those vows, make the vow, and then make it again, and again, and again, and again. That motivation, that gasoline in my tank, that compass heading, is now going to be my new pole star. This is my Polaris up there in the sky. The current pole star is in Sagittarius. It's in the constellation Sagittarius. The pole star changes over the millennia. that It changes, right? But the current one that you, the universe, our universe, seems to circle around is up there in Sagittarius. And it doesn't move. Bodhisattva's vows don't move now. What does it say? It says, Fozi Pusa Zhu Huan Xi Di Fa Ru Shi Da Shi Yuan Ru Shi Da Yong Meng Ru Shi Da Zou Yong Yi Ci Shi Yuan Men Wei Shou Man Zhu Bai Wan E Seng Qi Da Yuan Disciples of the Buddha, when Bodhisattvas stay on the stage of happiness, they make vows like these. Their courage is thus. Thus is their great abilities. With these ten vows as foremost, they complete a million Asankhya great vows. That's how it is, says Vajra Treasury. So that's our story. We finished the, the actual core message. There are several. This, this first stage is, is rich. But um, when our, our Tang Dynasty guide, Master Chengguan, when he reduced every one of the ten stages to a single word, first stage, vows. This is it. 
This is the foundation of the rest of his cultivation, the rest of his education as a bodhisattva. It's right here. Now, before we finish uh, with the text and, and share some stories, I wanted to get us to this next passage. This next passage is so uh, typically Avatamsaka, and it's really unforgettable. Uh, people who say this sutra is about philosophy haven't read it. Sorry. Read it. You'll think different. What is coming up? Preview here. This next passage is how endless the Bodhisattva makes his vows. How does he approach a vow? And now, before, before I got to Gold Mountain Monastery and heard the way Master Hua um, gave us vows, to me, vows were uh, New Year's resolutions. New Year's resolutions, boy, if you, could, if you could remember them the next day, you were doing good. If you thought about them the next week, you were doing good. If you could remember it at all in the next month, you were rare. New Year's Eve resolutions came and went. They were uh, well-intentioned on December 31st. <laughs> January 2nd, nah, they were hard to, hard to remember. That was it. So when Master Hua talked about vows, I had to retool, I had to re-put some more starch in my understanding of what a vow was. And the Avatamsaka Bodhisattvas, 10 stages Bodhisattvas way of reinforcing his vows, they're about to come up here. Well, we've got a substantial windstorm. Here it is. Oh, not that, not that. That's coming up later. Here's where, this is what I want. There we go. I'll read it, hanging on for a little more Chinese. Those of you who are still, like me, who are still learning our Chinese, you can look at the characters or look at the, the romanization. Make it a little bigger, a little bigger. Ah, look at that, that's nice. Here we go, ready? Shi 乃至世界转法转智转接近 This was a challenge to translate. I remember this keeping, you have to keep these things, keep your ducks all lined up to get the, the flow. But once you see it, the inner structure of this passage just is so rewarding. Okay, what is it? These are propositions of infinity. This, the Bodhisattva is gonna tell us when his vows will end, when her vows will end. The answer is, they don't. But here's how he sets it up. Here's how she sets it up in mind. Disciples of the Buddha, these great vows come to accomplishment through 10 statements about cessation. When do, what are the 10? They are. My vows could end if, ready? Take a deep breath. My vows could end if the realm of beings could end, if realms of worlds could end, if the realm of empty space could end, if the Dharma realm could end if the realm of nirvana could end, if the realm of Buddha's appearing could end, if the wisdom of thus come ones could end, if the realm of thoughts could end, if the realm of states mastered by the Buddha's wisdom could end, if the realm of worlds turning, of dharma turning and knowledge turning could end, 
Okay, that's it. If the realm of beings came to an end, my vows would also end. If the realm of worlds, up to and including the realm of the turning of worlds, dharmas, and knowledge came to an end, then my vows would also end. The realm of beings, however, cannot end, up to and including the realm of the turning of worlds, dharma, and knowledge cannot end. Thus, the qualities of goodness that create my great vows can also never end. So, typical flower garland sutra avatamsaka structure, you get 10 things. 10 things are listed. And there's a if then structure, followed by a however that if can't, so won't. Right? If this could happen, that could happen. This won't happen, so therefore those things won't happen. And the list of 10, but they're shortened. There's a Niger construction in here, which is to say uh, up to and including. So you get the first and the tenth, and the other eight in the middle, he doesn't go through them endlessly. There is a sutra, there's the Mahaprajna Paramita Sutra, uh, where they don't do the up to, <laughs> up to and including. You get all ten, and then you get all ten, and you get all ten. So the Mahaprajna Paramita Sutra, if you removed all the repetitions, it would be a slimmer text. It's, that's the longest of sutras, the Mahaprajna Paramita Sutra. It's not the most extensive, but it's the longest, if that makes sense. So what does he say? Ten statements about cessation. What are they? My vows, the ones you just heard, my ten vows we just talked about, vast and great as the Dharma realm, those ten, they can end. But if you want to know how long they're going to last, let me ask you about other things. Is the realm of living beings going to end? Are we suddenly going to be without beetles? Are we suddenly going to be without amoeba? Is plankton in the ocean going to vanish? Well, if so, living beings will end. Will worlds come to an end? Okay, now this one, I mean, this one is like anybody who reads science fiction. Parallel universes they talk about. Do you believe it? Do you, do, do you see them? Do you experience them? Well, this realm of worlds, like where the, uh, the climate summit is happening soon in Glasgow. Every six years, five, six years, the world comes together to look at the, the planet, climate disruption. It's happening this week. Leaders of the world are gathering in Glasgow. And uh, the word that keeps popping up is extinction. The Anthropocene, the human-influenced world, is about to, it's, clearly it's coming to an end. Ice caps are melting, glaciers are gone, right? So, the question is not, will it end? It's going to end for who? Maybe for humans. But what happens then? That's the question. Is another world, another realm going to pop up? Yes, according to the Buddha. That's why it says, if the realm of worlds could end. One end is another beginning. Okay, how about empty space? Will that end? Mm. Nope. Dharma realm? Nope. Nirvana? Nope. Buddha's appearing. Wisdom of thus come ones. Thoughts? Could your thoughts really end? Or states mastered by the Buddha? Nope, not going to end. And then we get this weird thing, which is turning. The Chinese says, shi jie zhuan. Honestly, I haven't found an, a, a useful explanation of what it means. Worlds turning, dharma turning, knowledge turning. This may be um, like a uh, when they they say uh, when it's factored by two squared cubed like that worlds squared worlds cubed so uh, knowledge cubed it's there's a dimension here that is that needs more explanation however that's the tenth then he says Remember that first thing I said, living beings? If that ends, my vows will end. You know what? That's not going to end. My vows won't end. <laughs> got it. <laughs> See what I, it's like you got to hold these 
these quantities in your mind to get the sense of it. But once you see it, what the, Bodh what the Bodhisattva is telling us here, what Bhajra Treasury is saying is, Bodhisattva's vows are lasting. Not like New Year's resolutions that disappear like snow under the noonday sun. They last. Okay. What happens next week, what happens next is what happens to the Bodhisattva after making those vows. After the Bodhisattva makes those vows, things change. Things really change. Things are different. We have just gone through one of the three times of the year when we particularly celebrate Kuan Yin Bodhisattva. Guan Shi and Posa. Guan Yin Bodhisattva's uh, leaving home, uh, realizing, uh, realizing the way, and entering nirvana. Those particular, uh, not what holidays do we say? Yes, those those events take place three times a year. We just went through one of them. It's the autumn version of it, and uh, I reviewed a bunch of my songs that just keep popping up. Uh, I want people to be able to sing uh, about Guan Yin, because praise is one of the ways that we approach beings uh, that we love and admire. So uh, I'm always listening for new ways to praise Guanyin Bodhisattva. And here is one of them. Oh, here, let's do it this way. There we go. Yep. Uh, if you get five extra points if you can identify the, the Christian spiritual that this tune came from. Rescues living beings. One in Bodhisattva rescues living beings. One Bodhisattva rescues living beings. She made vows to rescue living beings. One in Bodhisattva, she will take your call. One in Bodhisattva, get out your cell phone. She'll take your call. Bodhisattva, she'll take your call. Say her name and she will take your call. There we go. Go on, Bodhisattva. Call her name out loud. 
call her name out loud. Call her name out loud When you need her Call her name out loud When you need her Call her name out loud Anybody know the name of that? It's called Jesus on the Main Line. <laughs> Ry Cooter does the best version. Jesus on the Main Line. Tell him what you want. Call him up and tell him what you want. So, Guanyin Bodhisattva, she will take your call. Okay, um, one of the uh, benefits of, of sitting in this seat where I'm sitting is I have what's called a bully pulpit. And the bully, the bully pulpit, translate that one, but bully pulpit is a, is a privileged position that I have your, as long as people have tuned in to listen. I have your ear. And uh, so I'm mindful of the privilege that that gives me. Um, and I, I, the, I have a, there's a power, any, any preacher at the pulpit, any politician at the rostrum, uh, any, I guess any Facebook page too, it's a bully pulpit. Um, there's a responsibility there to be kind and to use ahimsa, harmlessness, to not harm while, I, while my voice is coming to you and I'm looking at that camera. So I'm, I'm very mindful of that and try not to give political opinions or propaganda or falseness um, and instead use the opportunity to enrich, to enhance, to inspire, to encourage, to support, uh, to inform. That's what I want to do. That's my goal. Um, to be able to share the wisdom stories of the Buddha's sutras and the, uh, that the principles of the sutras and the stories that, that uh, illustrate them, that is a great deep joy and a privilege and a blessing. And I uh, wouldn't trade it uh, to be able to, to talk to uh, the community once a week, twice a week, or more often. Um, we have monks in our tradition, Master Jin Fan, who does it every night. Jin Fan sure has got a, an audience uh, that he talks to every single night, um, which is marvelous. That's real vigor. Um, as, as did our teacher, as did Master Shenhua. So to, I want to use that, that bully pulpit, that opportunity, uh, wisely and carefully, mindfully. So here's something that gives me great pleasure that I want to share with you all, is to introduce you, if you have not discovered it, to coronavirus. What is coronavirus? We'll go to their homepage. Hey, where's that dog coming from? That's interesting. We got a dog. Coronavirus, go right here. There we go. Ah. Here's coronavirus homepage. Karuna, Sanskrit word for compassion. Currently, there are 3,925 good news stories. They call it a virus because like the coronavirus, which obviously this pun is working off of, uh, it is infectious. It communicates. Um, story, 3,900 stories. In Nebraska, U.S. sophomore Blake Cerveni was aiming to beat his personal record in a cross-country race, but his legs gave out before he could reach the finish line. 22 miles cross-country. I used to run cross-country. Determined to finish, he got up and pushed forward, but he collapsed again. Another runner behind him, Brandon Shutt, from a different school, came to the rescue and helped Cervani to his feet, finishing the race together. That's what cross-country is, says Cervani. It doesn't matter who you're going up against or the people you're around. Um, story goes, this young man, 
he's a sophomore. He's a new, new runner across the country. He was trying to set a personal best, but he had, I forget the reason, but his, uh, he, he uh, exhausted it. His, his legs stopped. It was 22 miles, 27, 22 miles across the country. And he collapsed. He got up, determined to finish. He was 200 yards from, or 200 feet from the finish line. And he got up again, fell again, got up again, fell again. Coming behind him was a senior, a man in his last, a student in his last race, who was going to be, you know, setting, there's a lot at stake. And he saw uh, Blake fall three times. He picked him up ran with him, supported him, and then when they got to the finish line, pushed the young man over the finish line before him. And then he crossed the line himself. Remarkable story. And then uh, as the, uh, when the story was being told, um, they met again. The two of them, they didn't know each other, but they met again. And uh, the, uh, let's see here. Did we not get the video? I was hoping to show the video. Let's see here. Here we go. Here's, here's the young man after the third collapse. Luckily, there was a photographer on the spot who uh, captured it. Had him picking him up running with him, supporting him all the way to the end. That is courage and selflessness. Here they are meeting for the first time. Maybe uh, we won't test the computer gods with the video. But there we go. There's a story from coronavirus. And this website has got you know, now close to 4,000 stories. And they began during the pandemic. You ready for another one? Ready? Even Colorado's largest wildfires was no match for beavers. <laughs> this is a uh, highly, highly, I looked it up. I knew you were going to need to know what is a beaver in Chinese. It's a highly. Millions of years of building dams and shaping waterways have not only made beavers expert water managers, but also enabled them to survive wildfires, which have destroyed the landscape around them. I'm going to undo, I selected that, but I'm going to get rid of it. There we go. Uh, the largest wildfire last year in Fort Collins, Colorado, could not touch the sprawling network of pools and canals constructed by these industrious creatures. When you're at this beaver complex, says eco-hydrologist Emily Fairfax, it never stops being green. Everything else in the landscape, the hill slopes on either side, they're both charred by the fire. They lost all their vegetation, but this spot, it did not. The dams and canals built by the beavers serve as a means of storing melt water from the mountains, and humans are learning another valuable lesson from nature. Check it out. Here, look at, notice, burned, burned. What about this? Hmm, green, lots of water. Deep in the Cameron Peak burn scar, northwest of Fort Collins, nestled among charred hills, lies an oasis of green, an idyllic patch of trickling streams that wind through the lush grass meadow. Apart from a few scorched trees in the periphery, it's hard to tell the canyon wetland was surrounded by the largest wildfire just a year ago. Right? What's going on? Beavers. This is, beavers have been chewing on that log. So the semi-aquatic rodents related to, to rats quite famously dam streams to create a sprawling network of pools and canals that offer safety anywhere within the meadow. Beavers, who can grow to 60 pounds, are clumsy on land but talented swimmers. On a recent visit to the patch of preserved land in Poudre Canyon, Eco-hydrologist Emily Fairfax emphasized the size of the Beaver's Canal Network. Bleak evidence of the Cameron Peak Fire in 2020, which destroyed 208,913 acres of national forest, is all around. 
Oh my gosh, I can't even count them, Fairfax said of the beaver canals. It's a lot. There's at least 10, pound, 10 ponds up here that are large enough to see in satellite images. And then between all these ponds is just an absolute spider web of canals, many of which are too small for me to see until I'm here on the ground. And it's that infrastructure that gives beavers safety from predators and shields them from wildfires. Here she is, here's Emily. Look at the, the trees behind her that are burned, but it's green right where she is. Uh, so beavers have millions of years of practice building dams and shaping waterways that makes them capable water managers. Okay, so that's the kind of story that you get in coronavirus. I like it because it just reminds you that there are bigger principles at work in the world around us. And science, while it gives us lots of uh, solutions, it doesn't have all the answers, right? So coronavirus is divided among resources, community, daily good, inspiration, and schools. Uh, and the inspiration I like a lot. Um, recently, one of the best stories, again, came from people giving basketball backboards, <laughs> basketball nets. Uh, there was a young man, uh, Anthony, he's 14 years old, who didn't have a basketball hoop. He just had a driveway and a basketball. So what did he do? He, had a, he would go up to a tree as if it were a basketball hoop and shoot at the tree. Of course, no hoop, you can't, you know. He was afraid that his neighbors were getting upset by the sounds of thunk, 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 dribbling. Well, here comes this white man. And uh, let's see, this is worth, this is worth watching. Let's see if we can watch it. I'll go out to YouTube because that's probably got a bigger, stronger scene. Here we go. You can add, we'll miss the ad here. NBA, might some more. We'll miss both ads. Okay, thank you. Here we go. I'm just uh, here, I'm outside dribbling, dribbling on the driveway, dribbling down the block, just shooting at the tree, just doing his thing, you know, he's just being a good kid, he looked like he had a passion for ball, so I uh, just figured, hey, let's uh, try and find this kid a net, so uh, yeah, we just created a post online and uh, on a Facebook page, and um, yeah, we were just blown away with all the support from the community and stuff like that. Everybody wanted to help the kid out. He had knocked on the door, and the kid, Anthony, thought he was going to get busted. You like ball? Yeah. There you go. Uh, thanks. Come on out. Your mom said you wanted to be a basketball player. Yeah. <laughs> Come here. You probably need a net. So this, this is from people at Canadian Tire. They thought we should have a net. We set up a little something and uh, yeah, so now we got a net. We got a ball. And then more people, um, they wanted to help out too. People from all around the north side. So uh, they wanted you to have that. Thanks. This actually means a lot. I know it does. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I see you dribbling the ball all the time. You need a net to shoot on, right? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So go ahead, open up your card, buddy. Here, I'll hold the ball. Okay. Anthony, keep following your dreams and work hard. And anything is possible. Love the rays and all the nights out. And there's some cash there for you, so you can go buy whatever you want at Sport Check. There's seven hundred and fifty dollars there. So uh, even at this point, you can see Anthony, who's you know 14 years old. He's going. Um, I'm not. Where's the hook? <laughs> where, where does the butt come? You know. And then, and he answers himself. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, man. Wow. No, you're a good kid. Good, good kids deserve good things. So keep, keep doing what you're doing, man. Work hard. Follow your dreams. Okay. You betcha, buddy. You betcha, man. I was scared at first when he first turned up because he was a little intimidating. Like, I mean, just look at him, he almost looks like Thor. And he's like, it was like a little scary because I felt like he, people were getting annoyed from my dribbling. So, and then he gives me the basketball net and I was like, wow, I'm trying to hit the professional career, like work hard to make it to that stage, make it to the NBA and show everybody what's up. Like, you know how they say, to rookies in the NBA, welcome, and I'll be I'll be welcoming them soon. So yeah. All right. Coronavirus, highly recommended. I'm gonna switch back out of video mode here. Oh, okay. There we go. So if you're feeling like you could use a little bit of an inspiration, uh, definitely check out coronavirus dot org even better is join uh you can get involved join the movement and these are that's, that's by the way my photo i'm pleased with that um these are just volunteers they're just folks who uh these are the volunteers here who are doing it and as i say it uh it began uh completely during pandemic and uh some of these folks are our neighbors. Some of them are feeding us every week uh, and have done so. Some of them are watching the screen right this minute, I suspect, from up in Snow Mountain Monastery up in the Cascades. So if, uh, let's see here, I don't know uh, whether Jin Chuan or anybody or Jin Wei Shi is on with the news. Uh, Jerry, do we know if they are or not? I think maybe not. So I will do some advertising on my own here. Let's see. Um, Cliff, how many friends are listening from China today? 86. 86. We're growing in China. Uh, Jerry, how many do we have? We have, they're not online. Okay. 123 listening on YouTube. So that's our regular community. I did want to. Uh, talk about Berkeley Monastery briefly and let people know that uh, we have, uh, let's see here, here we go. These are uh, daily ceremonies will be on pause for one week. That's what I wanted you all to know. Um, because our monks are on a uh, visit and a retreat to Snow Mountain Monastery up in the Cascades, uh, Dharma Master Hung Lai's monastery. And uh, it's a beautiful time to be in the Pacific Northwest. And so, uh, now, Dharma Master Jin Fo um, will, take, will do the noon recitation. So if you check at our berkeleymonastery.org, you can uh, plug in to ceremonies part of the day, but uh, our entire team, except for Jin Voshir and Dharma Protectors, have gone up to the Cascades, to the Pacific Northwest. So let me let you know that uh, Snow Mountain Monastery, in case you're up there, smmdrba.org. This is uh, where you should go to find, see, what is Buddhism? What are our events about Snow Mountain Monastery? Um, this is when it's snowing. Currently, it's uh, autumn, so there's autumn leaves and colors. Uh, here's the community there. So just to let you know that it's, it is there, and they do have events. That's where our team is from Berkeley Monastery. We've gone up to visit, so. Alrighty, so some changes for a week. We'll be back to, uh, to full-time broadcasting of 
our events in a week when everybody's back. Okay, so what we're going to do now is going to chant our transference of merit. And transference of merit, as we're doing it, as people know, um, involves Medicine Buddha. He is Medicine Buddha, Yao Shufu, has a particular method that allows us to use our minds and our breath and our consciousness and our community to send out goodness in the form of a mantra. And mantras are vibrations. They're sounds that we put into the universe that uh, have a desired effect. And the desired effect of these sounds is healing. So it is a Mahayana Buddhist method of countering the pandemic, working on our minds. So we uh, chant this three times, send out the goodness, and with this, we transfer the merit of the listening to the 10 stages. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you all for joining. I'm pleased that you could be with me today for our Halloween edition of the Abhatamsaka's 10 stages chapter. Here we go. picture of the Buddha Hall at City of 10,000 Buddhas in an early state. I'm going to bow three times from my chair here and invite you all to join me. And I have a picture of our teacher and founder, Master Shrinha. Welcome you all to bow in respect to the Venerable Master.
So all you youngsters and young at heart folks who are trick-or-treating, as they say in England, mind how you go. Trick-or-treat mindfully, do more treating, less tricking. And we'll see you all next week. Ami tofu. Bye-bye, everybody.